that told me to start. Um, I've also been asked to give the shortest introduction ever because Nick has a lot of he wants to say to us tonight. So I'll be brief. Just to say that tonight's event is currently supported by the LSE Annual Fund, so we want to thank them for their support. Um, this event is organized by the LSE's Program in Culture and Cognition, which brings together social anthropologists, uh, social psychologists, philosophers, and others who are interested in the study of psychology, uh, especially as it um, human psychology, especially as it unfolds in, in the context of particular historical, social, cultural uh, environments. And over the past few years, one of the great pleasures of being involved with the Program in Culture and Cognition has been the fact that we've had Nick Humphrey around the LSE to talk with us, and we found him to be a really terrific person uh, to talk with about our own research and about his uh, projects. I think many of you know that uh, Nick's had a big influence on our understanding of social intelligence and, and of human consciousness more generally, and tonight he's going to talk to us about his not only latest, but also, I understand, final book uh, on the subject of human consciousness, which is called uh, Soulless. Please uh, join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you. Um, what excuse could I have for saying this is my last book on the subject, unless I thought I'd done it this time, um, but I've thought that before, but still, maybe, um, maybe this really is the last book I'll write on this subject, which I've been working on on and off for the last 40 years, I suppose. Um, the, the book's called the, the Magic of Consciousness, and my talk today is going to be about uh, the magical qualities of this extraordinary thing which goes on inside our minds, um, about how consciousness lights up the world for us and makes us feel special and transcendent, how it indeed creates the idea of the soul, and I'm going to be treading on some anthropological uh, uh, toes at that point maybe, and even how it leads to the idea of the immortal soul. But I'm not going to go straight there, um, so you're going to have to listen to some more philosophical, philosophical psychological stuff to begin with. I want to start by uh, making some remarks about the nature of conscious sensation, what it feels like uh, to have your hair pulled, for example, or to roast your nose in front of the fire, or to run uh, through the salt wet waves. Um, what's it feel like to be yourself in that sort of situation? And in fact, I want to start by telling you a, a quite new theory of what sensation amounts to. Now, to be clear about the words here, uh, by sensation, I mean the way we represent our interaction with the stimulation at the, at, the, at, the, at the surface of our bodies, light at our eyes, pressure on our skin, uh, sound at our ears, for example. Sensation is not the same thing as perception. Perception is the way we represent the outside world, the waves as such, or the fire as such. But sen sensation is something much more personal, the way we represent what's happening to us and how we as subjects evaluate it. The pain is in my toe, and it's horrible. The sweet taste is on my tongue, and it's sickly. The red light is at my eyes, and it's stirring me up. It's as if, in having sensations, we're both registering the objective fact of stimulation and expressing our personal bodily opinion about it. <clears throat> and indeed, as I'll show us shortly, I hope, I think we are doing something just like that. But it's the way we do it which is so surprising. Um, the, what we represent this bodily opinion um, as being. Where do those extra qualitative dimensions come from? What can, be, what can make the subjective present seem so rich and deep, as if we're living in the thick moment of consciousness? What can Kandinsky mean when he writes, colour is a power which directly influences the soul. Colour is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the, is the piano with many strings. Why indeed do we say, in English at least, that it's like something to be conscious? Why don't we say it is something to be conscious? Is it because sensations are in some way like something that actually they can't really be? Well, I'll be coming to that. Um, but in asking these questions, we're up against what many of you will know of as the hard problem of consciousness. Um, it's been called that by David Chalmers and the name's called on. And I don't need to tell you that this is a problem which some of our best philosophers have said almost reveled in the fact that it can't ever be solved. Jerry Fodor, for example, tells us so almost every, every week. 
a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we can't as things stand now so much as imagine a solution to the hard problem. The revisions of our concepts and theories that imagining a solution will eventually require are likely to be very deep and very unsettling. There's hardly anything we may not have to cut loose from before the hard problem is through with us. Well, Frodo's right, of course, that we haven't been doing too well in imagining an answer. And the problem does seem sometimes impossibly hard. But I think we should put the emphasis on that word seem, because for something to seem to have mysterious or inexplicable properties doesn't, of course, mean it necessarily really has them. And I'll explain what I mean by that with a well-known example. Suppose we were to come across an object lying on a bench made out of wood that looked just like this, like the impossible triangle. It would seem for sure to be a physical impossibility. But that doesn't mean we should throw away our physics books and cut loose from everything we know. Um, of course, what we'd soon realize is that it must be some kind of illusion. And sure enough, if we could only look at it from a different point of view, we'd soon discover that what we were actually looking at is this strange object which was made some years ago by Richard Gregory, an object carefully constructed to deceive us when we look at it just from that one particular point of view. As Sherlock Holmes said, once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And I think that the truth about consciousness, if only we can see it from the right perspective, is that it is indeed a highly improbable piece of biological engineering, a clever trick played on us by, on us by nature, but one which really does, in the end, have a relatively simple, straightforward explanation. So where are we going to begin, and what questions should we be asking? Well, Jerry Fodor has had more, more to say. He's often good at asking questions. Um, nobody, he writes, has the slightest idea what consciousness is, or what it's for, or how it does what it's for, to say nothing of what it's made of. Well, let's forget about the nobody for the moment. Um, what, uh, I think those surely look like, real, like rather good questions. What consciousness is, what phenomenal consciousness is, what it's for, how it does what it's for, and what it's made of. Um, and there, these are, in fact, the, the questions I'm going to use to structure my talk, at least the first half of it. But I'm not going to give them equal weight, because what really excites me are some new ideas about what consciousness is for, about its evolutionary function, and that will be the, most of the second half of the talk. So let's begin with those other ones. So what is phenomenal consciousness? What kind of thing? is the sensation of red, or the salt taste of an anchovy, or the searing pain of a burn? Well, my answer is that it's my kind of magical recreation, a show that you lay on for yourself inside your own head. In response to stimulation of your sense organs, you create something, an extraordinary artwork, I don't think you might even call it, um, for your mind to look at. It's a simulacrum of sorts. Um, so which it does track the, it, the interaction of your body with the outside world, the sights, the sounds, and smells. So that means that by forming a mental representation of this thing in your head, you can indeed get a picture of what's happening to you. But this object you're creating does much more than merely track your interaction in an objective sense. It steeps it in the subjectivity. It adds a personal dimension. It colors it with emotion. And on top of that all, it, it adds a mysterious dimension of temporal depth. So now, when you form a representation of it, you don't simply discover what's happening, what's happening to you on an objective level. You get to have a picture that it's something, that it's like something to have, in a way I'll explain. A picture that has indeed acquired some weird and wonderful properties, lifting you as the subject of it into a different level of reality, or perhaps one might say of non-reality. So, to go to the next question of us, uh, why do we do it? Um, I'm going to come back to that later, but let's have this to stab at it. Whatever can be the purpose of this self-created theatre in our head? Well, many of you will know that philosophers have mocked the idea of there being any such theatre where the brain creates a show, creates a simulacrum for itself to look at. Daniel Dennett, in particular, um, has written that the persuasive imagery of the Cartesian theatre keeps coming back to haunt us, lay people and scientists alike, even after its ghostly, ex ghostly dualism has been denounced and exorcised. Well, Dennett would, of course, be right if this was what was going on. Um, he'd be right to reject the, 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 
idea that there's a place in where, in your head where you create a replica of the world for yourself to look at, which of course would lead to an infinite regress, who would then be looking at the replica of the replica, and so on. But despite its entry into the philosophical literature, I think this use of the word theatre is entirely misleading. Replication is not what theatres are about, not real humanly created theatres anyway. Instead, real theatres are places where events are staged in order to comment in one way or another on the world, to educate or persuade or to entertain. Nobody goes to the play in order to see a replica of events. They want to see, they they go there for the added value that the theatre is going to lay on. Um, This audience are not entranced by seeing just a a replica of reality. It's a story which they're being told. Um, And um, so uh, it's quite quite true that this audience wouldn't be in the least interested in seeing uh, a replica of of, of something which is already uh, out there in the world. But just imagine it would be quite a different story if this Friday could be transformed, uh, mixed with butter and, 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 and transformed into, uh, into a batter and placed on bread and suddenly began to re- represent the Virgin Mary. Um, that's, and indeed, you, they, you'd sit up and think something very interesting was going on. This, rep- this replica, uh, as you know, sold for $3,000 on eBay. Um, it's, uh, what I want to say is that in the case of consciousness, um, what I'm going to suggest is that one part of your brain is indeed staging a magical show like this to influence the judgment of another part of your brain, to sell the world for you, to sell the world to you, and indeed maybe to sell it for more than it's really worth. And what's that for, biologically? What's the payoff at the level of survival? In what respect do conscious creatures actually lead more successful lives? Well, that's the issue I'm going to discuss at some length later on, but here's my preliminary answer. I believe the biological function of consciousness, just like the function of the best of theatre, is to change your world view. Philosophers and scientists who've asked this question have routinely missed the point because they've had completely the wrong expectations about what consciousness is doing. They've expected consciousness to be playing some kind of practical role in cognition or in intelligence. And then they've been puzzled because it doesn't seem to. Jerry Fodor again. Consciousness, he says, seems to be among the chronically unemployed. Um, What mental processes can be performed only because the mind is conscious? And what does consciousness contribute to their performance? Why then did God bother to make consciousness? Well, of course, Frederick is asking the right question there. Why did God or natural selection bother to make it? But you'll see he's assumed that consciousness must be providing us with some new kind of skill helping us achieve some outcome that we can only achieve because we're conscious. Like, say, a bird can fly only because it's got wings, or you can understand what I've just said only because you know the English language. I'd suggest the role of consciousness isn't like that at all. Let me say it again. Consciousness is theatre. It changes our outlook on life. Its job is to change our outlook on life. Being conscious is not like having a cognitive makeover. It's more like falling in love. It's not like having a new set of mental, clever new set of mental tools. It's more like having a new reason for existing. And just how does that pay off in terms of biological survival? How can watching the show be genuinely life enhancing? Well, we'll wait and see. I'll give an answer later on. But meanwhile, however however does consciousness get us there? How does it do what it's for? How does it manage to excite us in this way? making us feel that we're in the presence of something so extraordinary. Well, um, if this is what's on show, what can be going on backstage in order to create it? What strings are being pulled within the brain? What kind of activities are actually occurring in nerve cells, if I can represent it by, by an equation like that? Well, I think the answer is that this is indeed a well-constructed illusion a trick played by one part of your brain on the other. And now you'll see why I've chosen this impossible construction to illustrate what it's like to be conscious. Because, as we've already seen, it's quite possible to construct something that looks like this, for real. It would be difficult, perhaps, to construct that, and I'm sure somebody could do it, but at least, as we saw, 
it's possible to construct something that looks like that for real. And in fact, let's watch it being done. Now the sound's off. Own three dimensional one? Let's get to work. Now by placing the cut and folded paper on the floor and placing your camera or your eye at just the right angle, you've made a Penrose triangle. So um, here's what you see, um, and here's what you've made backstage to create the illusion. Um, that's what I'm suggesting, and I'm, I'm serious. I think this famous illusion provides just the kind of model we need for understanding consciousness. Here is something, a real physical object, that seen from the special point of view is, in the most literal sense, like something. It's like something it actually can't be. It's like this magic, it seems. But still, as we've just seen, it's something that can be constructed by entirely mundane means. And if you can do that with paper and scissors, imagine what natural selection could have done with all the resources of the brain. But let's note that the crucial thing will be that we as subjects see this thing uh, we're creating from that one particular point of view. Um, you have to, you have, we, we, we see it this way. To anyone else, it might look just like that. Um, and I'm not going to go into the neuroscience here, but I will point out that there's a potential problem for anyone who goes looking in the brain for what people have called the neural correlate of consciousness, the NCC. Because if I'm right, there must be a real danger that scientists aren't going to recognize the NCC for what it is, even when it's right in front of them. Suppose you were to discover that wooden object lying on the table, the one which looks like this, um, without knowing what it was meant to be. Um, you wouldn't, of course, pay it any attention. You'd just think it was a, an oddity, nothing interesting, whatever. And I think, uh, likewise, suppose if you would open up a person's brain and discover the illusion-generating brain activity, I think you might never guess that you'd crack the hard problem and would do the Nobel Prize. Um, so uh, scientists beware. They better find out, think very carefully about what they're expecting to find before they go in and look for it, and I don't think they have. Um, but let's me turn, turn to the next question. Uh, what actually is this thing in the brain made of? What kind of activity could it really be? And I take this to mean in the first place, um, what's it made from historically? Um, how was it put together in evolution? I think we can never approach any question in psychology or, 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 or psychology, psychology or, or anthropology for that matter without thinking at least about its evolutionary history. Beginning there, how did, that's the original state of things. How did we get to this magical mystery show down here? Um, well, uh, let me tell you, um, I think the answer is uh, that in order for this to become a show, it had to be a show to start with. And I think the answer is that sensations have indeed always involved a kind of performance. Indeed, that sensations originated in evolution as a form of active response to stimulation, a bodily expression of what was happening to the animal and how it felt about it. Bodily expression which the animal then took notice of, a uh, performance of a sort. So let me tell you the very brief history as I understand it of what happened to uh, how sensations arose. Um, let's begin with a, a very primitive animal floating around in the seas back in the pre-Cambrian period, let's say. Um, things are happening to this, this animal. Uh, light falls on it, pressure waves push up against it, chemicals are uh, touching its, 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 uh, its, its skin and so on. And some of these things are going to be good for the animal and some of them are going to be bad for them and some, some, and some of them are going to be neutral, let's say. And so it's going to need to respond to them in appropriate ways, to this with an out, say, to that with a hui. Um, so uh, what's going to happen is um, that we're going to uh, get a situation in which they're being assessed, that the, the stimuli are being assessed um, uh, and the, the animal is performing some kind of wriggle of acceptance or rejection, let's say. Um, a smile, a skull, uh, a grin, whatever it might be at the level of a very primitive uh, organism. To begin with, these responses are just that, they're mere responses. 
the animal is in no way mentally aware of the stimulus it's responding to. However, suppose that the animal were actually to want to know what was happening to it, to form a represent, mental representation of that stimulus it's responding to. Well, a neat solution would be for the animal to monitor its own response, since this reflex behaviour potentially carries loads of information about the stimulus, what it is, where it is, um, when it's happening, and with what import for the animal's well-being. Um, and so it did happen, uh, at least I believe in the course of evolution, um, that uh, our ancestors soon discovered that, that they could represent what was happening at their body surfaces by monitoring what they themselves were doing about it. However, things were not going to stay like that, even if that's how they began. Because the time was going to come in evolution when these actual other behaviours, which I've shown actually occurring at the body, the animal's body surface, um, they're no longer, no longer going to be appropriate. The animal no longer wants to engage in active other bodily expression. Yet it still does want to track the stimulation. It still wants to know what's happening to it. Um, so what can it do? Well, the answer is for the responses to become internalised, where they can still be monitored. And so to cut this story short, um, the upshot of it is that sensory responses have become what I've called privatised. So when today we experience sensory stimulation, we ourselves, we human beings, are still responding with something like the ancient action pattern handed down from our ancestors. But now it's become a virtual actual action pattern, uh, taking a, 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 a kind of level of virtual body inside our heads. Now it is indeed a kind of pantomime, something whose purpose is no longer to do anything about the stimulation, but only to tell about it. Action, indeed, has become acting. To take the case of red, just to give you an example, seeing red, for example, red light arrives at our eyes, and the next thing, behind the scenes, not now on the surface, we make an effective response to it. It's an ongoing response. I've shown it actively there, um, and I've given it an active name. I've called this kind of response redding, and I might call it salting or, or painting, for example. Um, and uh, well, so this is what's happening in response to the stimulation. And where is the sensation in all of this? Well, the sensation is our own response as monitored by introspection. To have a sensation of red is to feel ourselves redding, find ourselves redding. So, here's my point. Sensation has always been theatre of a sort. Yet at, at the start of it, of course, it, it was, it was theatre, but it won't have been magical theatre. There's no reason to think the century show will have had any of those extraordinary phenomenal qualities which we now know so well as conscious sensations. So, what happened next? How did these internalised bodily responses um, change their change their spots and become uh, illusion, illusion generating. Um, how did that become that so that the sensation could become a phenomenal sensation? Well, having seen what this sensory show has evolved from, what those responses are, uh, where they began, can we now guess what it's made of, how it's actually constituted so as to produce the magical effects? Well, it is a guess, um, but I, do, I guess the answer lies in the process of privatisation, which I've just described. What the privatisation of sensory responses did when we moved from that state where there was a real response to this one is to create the potential for re-entrant feedback loops. Now, the thing about a feedback loop is that when conditions are right, the activity, activity, activity in it can become, for a brief while at least, self-sustaining. And what's more, the sustained activity can take on some very remarkable properties. Suppose that each time the activity cycles around the feedback loop, the transmission characteristics here, uh, what, how, how this changes in crossing from input to output, are actually modified by the activity in the loop the first time around, and so on round and round in an iterative way. Well, then the activity in the loop is going to be described by what mathematicians call a delay differential equation. Um, and uh, typically, once started, the activity will either develop chaotically, and nothing very interesting will happen, or else it will settle into a so-called attractive state, in a state where the same pattern repeats itself indefinitely from there on. 
um, this film clip shows you an example of a, 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 an attractor state developing in a feedback loop. an example of an attractor state in three dimensions um, and here's another one again occurring by the lay differential equation in three dimensions but um, typically the attractor will turn out to be very much more complicated than that and will occupy a higher dimensional landscape the number of additional dimensions can be very large indeed in fact there will be cases where it would, would require a graph with an infinite number of dimensions to describe it but if we want the potential for magic then surely here we've got it. Suppose that natural selection in designing the sensory show had all those extra dimensions to play with. The mind boggles, perhaps literally, at the possibilities for creating objects, mathematical objects, in the brain that when observed from the inside would give rise to the illusion of something with extraordinary otherworldly properties. But let me be more specific about that. Uh, if there's one thing that everybody has thought about sensory consciousness has remarked on, it's, it's the peculiar temporal characteristics of it. Uh, let's see whether we can say something about that. Imagine yourself looking at a cascading waterfall or listening to the song of the nightingale. Physical time is flowing linearly forward with no let up in the relentless passage from instant to instant. But that's not how you experience it at the level of sensation. Rather, the present moment, the now of sensation, seems to hang in there, as if each, sense, each instance of sensation is still there for us for a brief, brief period after we create it, as if it happens for longer than it happens. Just to remind you, it's like... So, uh, let's go back from that. Um, let's... Uh, What's going on? What could be creating this sense of temporal thickness? Um, well, as it happens, um, is there some kind of feedback loop which could be doing that? As it happens, there's an answer we can take straight off the peg. Um, Douglas Hofstadter, who I just showed there, has pioneered the, the analysis of a particular class of feedback loops that he calls a strange loop. And in Hofstadter's words, in the series of stages that constitute the cycling round, there's a shift from one level of abstraction to another. And yet, somehow, the successive upward shifts turn out to give rise to a closed cycle. Despite one's sense of departing ever further from one's origin, one winds up to one's shock exactly where one had started out. Well, what might this look like uh, for the observer? What if we had this behind the scenes? Well, if you want a visual spatial metaphor, it might, of course, be rather like this, like climbing an endless staircase that always takes you back to the same place you set out from. Or if you want an auditory metaphor, it might be rather like this, like listening to a glissando, which rises in the notes all the time, but actually never seems to get anywhere. <laughs> exactly back where we started. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, well, how do you think, how, how might thick time actually arise from an illusion of this sort? Well, look at it this way. If you climb the staircase um, starting there uh, and come back to where you've started, we conventionally say that you've risen, you've ascended no distance um, in physical space. Um, but of course, in this strange situation, time and, and, and distance are actually equivalent. And we could equally, equally say that you've actually passed no time. Imagine that you've measured time by counting your steps. One second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, etc. Eleven seconds, twelve seconds, thirteen seconds, no seconds. You're back where you started. Um, you would have used up time, you'd have spent time without actually uh, you, so you spent time without actually uh, using it up in a way. 
Now, to translate that back to sensation, suppose that in responding to a sensory stimulus, you were to initiate activity in a food feedback loop, which had one of these strange attractors um, at its, at its centre. Um, then when you monitored yourself doing it, it, I think it's at least possible that you might indeed find yourself living in what I've called the thick moment of consciousness. Uh, it's a guess, but I dare say at least that it's something that could really work, something on those lines can really work. Now, of course, these ideas all need much more work. Um, I won't claim we've actually cracked the hard problem of consciousness, but I will claim that cracks are appearing in it. We're beginning to see the sort of solution that could do it. Um, and I'm going to leave you at least with uh, that uh, te teaser as, as an answer to the mechanics of consciousness. But now I'm going to want to turn to the second, what I said was the more thing which excited me still more, the question of, the critical question of what consciousness is for, why we should be laying on uh, a show like this inside our heads. We've plotted a route um, from early sensory responses to this sort of strange thing going on in our, in our, in our heads, but um, why did natural selection take that route? Well, uh, I've hinted already at what I think the answer is. Consciousness is theatre. Watching the self-created spectacle from the royal box, as it were, we've come to, we come to a quite new view of just what and of, of, of who and what we are and the kind of world we live in. Well, there's so much to discuss and I'm not going to, be able to deal with it adequately at all in the next half hour, but let me at least give you a taste of how this works, in human beings at least, of how our world is transformed. And I'll start with the very simplest level, which certainly is one we share with animals. In the process of becoming and remaining conscious, in the simple pleasure of being there, we discover a new purpose in our own existence. As Lord Byron wrote, the great object of life sensation, to feel that we exist even though in pain. Or as Tom Nagel, the philosopher, has put it more soberly, there are elements which have added to one's experience make life better. There are other elements which make, which have added to one's experience make life worse. But what remains when these are set aside is not merely neutral, it is emphatically positive. The additional positive weight is supplied by experience itself rather than by any of its contents. But, well, I think the word sensualism perhaps approaches but hardly does justice to this emotion. Maybe we need a word like presentism. At any rate, the emotion is a basic and familiar one. The yen to confirm and renew in small ways or large our own occupancy of the present subjective moment. Here's the poet, John Keats, in a letter to his friend sharing his mouth with us. Talking of pleasure, this moment I'm writing with one hand and with the other holding to my mouth a nectar. Good God, how fine. It went down soft, pulpy, slushy, oozy. All its delicious plumpness melted down my throat like a large, beatified strawberry. Or here, on a more heroic scale, is Albert Camus inviting us to enter the skin of his young body as he luxuriates amongst the ruins of Tipasa on the Algerian coast. How many hours, he wrote, have I spent crushing absinthe leaves, caressing ruins, trying to match my breathing with the world's tumultuous sighs. Deep among wild scents and concerts of somnolent insects, I open my eyes and heart to the unbearable grandeur of this heat-soaked sky. And, of course, uh, we see this kind of delight simply in being there, in animals too. Um, I could cite many examples, but here's one from Mark Beckhoff. Um, I once saw a young elk, he says, I saw a young elk run across a snowfield, jump in the air and twist his body while in flight, stop, catch his breath and do it again and again. Buffalo have been seen, playfully running onto and sliding across ice, excitedly bellowing as they do so. Well, if it were us, it would certainly be the sense of it's being like something to slide across the ice that would be providing the incentive. And I think who can doubt that it's the same for at least some other animals. Um, these bonobos uh, surely are enjoying just being themselves. But then here's the question. Why should feeling that we exist and valuing that feeling be biologically adapted so that the underlying brain circuits would have been selected in the course of evolution? I think the answer, at least the beginning of an answer, is right there in front of us. It is that a, a creature 
who takes pleasure in the feeling of existence, will develop a will to exist. And so, at least in humans, a will to live. Now, admittedly, you might think this has to be something of a bootstrap operation, like, say, like, like, like in the sound of your own voice. Um, but why not, if it works? We accept that nature made sex pleasurable to encourage people to have sex and animals to have sex. Then why not make living magically delightful to encourage life? And, at least in humans, to increase the fear of death. Philip Roth had this to say in an interview. I am indeed afraid of dying. I'm 72. Why am I, what am I afraid of? Oblivion. Of not being alive. Quite simply, of not feeling life. Not smelling it. And Roth is contrasting oblivion with something else. Something. And this something is provided by his sense of the theatrical space he occupies. Living in the presence of sensation. Feeling, smelling the thick moment of consciousness. For, of course, consciousness does much more than merely bring delight. It gives us something substantive to hold on to, something to aim for, a ball to hold up in the air. But that's just the start of it. Um, and so let me move to the next level, which, uh, I go through, which a level at which being conscious dramatically changes uh, people's world outlook. And that's what I'll call the enchantment of the world. Now, we should note that the simple joie de vivre the joy in life, smelling it, feeling it, uh, can often be thoroughly introverted, self, body centered. It's the sensations in themselves that matter, the feels and the smells, not the things in the world that, that, that give rise to them. In fact, when basking in the present moment of sensation, we may choose deliberately to pull away from the world, to enjoy sensations untroubled by reality. Uh, we do it, some, we can do it as an abstract painting. Matisse, for example, has taken a table laden with dessert and abstracted the pure forms. Um, and Bridget Riley goes still further, further in one of her paintings from an exhibition called According to Sensation. In the interview, Riley says, feel the light. Uh, no, don't think about it. Don't think about what's out there. Just feel this moment at your eye. But of course, at other times, in other moods, our delight in being conscious turns to, the, to being pointedly a delight in living in this very particular world of things. <coughs> Dutch artist Dahim, on which Matisse based his painting, has created not just a feast for the eyes, but drawn attention to the glories of the world in itself as such. The solid existence, the glittering silver and gold goblets, the plump fruits, the smooth linen, the things as such. Rupert Brooke does it for us in verse in an extraordinary poem called The Great Lover, which runs for 180 lines. Um, these I have loved, he writes, white plates and cups, clean gleaming, ringed with blue lines, and feathery fairy dust, wet roofs beneath the lamplight the strong crust of friendly bread and many tasting food, rainbows and the blue bitter smoke of wood, the benison of hot water, furs to touch, the good smell of old clothes and others such. The list is long, as I say, it goes on for 180 lines, and the poet fondles each commonplace sensory delicacy like a kind of bead on a rosary. Each item produces in us, the readers, a thrill of recognition, at least I think it does in it certainly does in me. But whatever's going on there, why do such ordinary things seem so precious to a human being? Well, surely it's because some of the magic of our sensations is rubbing off on the things themselves. So that it seems to us as if the things out there in the world possess phenomenal qualities in their own right. As if the things as such have an extra dimension of presence. Now, of course, strictly speaking, this doesn't make sense. The qualities of our sen of sensation are our creation, the way I described in the first part of the talk. No way do they truly belong out there in the external world. In the case of a red tomato, for example, it's a sensation of bright of light at our eyes that has the phenomenal qualities. Um, the tomato itself is physically red. It's not phenomenally red. It's just something reflecting light in a particular wavelength. Yet, here's the thing. All our experience has been 
that red tomatoes, red physical tomatoes, and red sensations go together. Salty anchovies and salty sensations go together. Cold water and cold sensations go together. So it's hardly surprising then if repeated association of the sensation with the perceived object that provides the stimulus is enough to give rise to the illusion that sensation is actually a property of the world out there. So that the tomato itself seems to acquire phenomenal properties. Now, there's no, there's no question that when we project phenomenal, phenomenal qualities out into the world, we are making a philosophical mistake, a category mistake. But it doesn't matter. Philosophical quibbles aren't going to stop us when the result is literally so enchanting. Things are getting enchanted and it's happening courtesy of our sensation. So the connection becomes particularly obvious when sensation is intensified. This can happen, for example, uh, with mind-altering drugs. Here's Aldous Huxley describing his experience with, with mescaline. The books with which my study walls were lined glowed with brighter colours, a profounder significance. Red books like rubies, emerald books, books bound in white jade, books of agate, of acne, of marine, of yellow topaz. Um, now, this is, is an exaggerated response under mescaline, but my point is that it really happens all the time. Dull perceptual objects become magical. Ordinary things glow with brighter colours, profounder significance for all of us, all the time, without us having to take drugs. Borrowed phenomenality, if I can use that term, transforms the world into an awesome place. A place all the more amazing because of the intimate connection we feel we have to it. A place where the things out there in the world seem to be singing our song, as indeed they are. How often have you looked into a fire or stared at a, whirly, a swirling pool and been knocked back by the sheer impossible beauty of it, your sense of union, your sense that somehow you're connected to it? And there's every reason to think that this is a trait we share with our non-human relatives too. Here's a film chim clip, clip of a chimpanzee from Gandhi. And looked at the stream, completely mesmerised, by the pattern of the flow through his fingers. I think, what, what's going through his mind? What, what, every day? What's suddenly changed about it? And looked at the stream. This is a, a caption from a... a an illustration from a new book called The Last, Last Human. It reads, The play of light and shadow between tree, sun and sky fills this Neanderthal man with a sense of awe. Well, why not? Why shouldn't we talk like that and think about our ancestors like that? Well then, how does this attitude of awe affect survival? It certainly puts us in a frame of mind, I think, to count our blessings. It's not just good to be alive, but to be alive in this astonishing world. Um, Rupert Brooke says it beautifully again. In a flicker of sunlight on a blank wall, or reach of muddy pavement, or smoke from an engine at night, there's a sudden significance and importance, and inspiration, that makes the breath stop. It's a feeling that has amazing results. I suppose my occupation is being in love with the universe. Well, if we want an adaptive function for consciousness, Perhaps being in love with the universe will do. But more specifically, what would it translate into? Being in love with the universe. Love is a powerful emotion. It motivates us to engage with things, to investigate them, to make them, to seek them out. Chimpanzee, as we saw, went to the stream. But how about this? The dolphins creating its own object in order to appreciate its sensory properties, which again it's projecting onto them. And of course, we humans are just the same, but even more so. Because we delight in the world, which we ourselves have lit up by our own creativity, we've become creatures dedicated to play and to exploration. 
with the result that simply by indulging our love affair with things, we learn ever more about the true potential of the world we live in. Another picture from another, another picture from that book. A juvenile Australopithecus africanus greets a new morning two and a half million years ago. Again, why not? It's the emotion for every child on a spring morning. Where am I going? I don't quite know. Down to the stream where the king cups grow. Up on the hill where the pine trees blow. Anywhere, anywhere, I don't know. Where am I going? The high rooks call. It's awful fun to be born at all. Well, awful fun is not the half of it. The fact is that life in this world for conscious creatures can be unspeakably beautiful and interesting. Ah, and... Did I put this picture on? I had to have sent it um, was sent yesterday by Tetsuro Matsuzara, so it's not another child going out to greet the morning. Okay, um, this is a wild chimpanzee, if possible. So I think this increased interest in being in the world could alone be enough to explain the adaptive advantage of redesigning sensations to give them phenomenal qualities, at least for the first steps that happened long ago before uh, humans came on the scene. But for humans, there's certainly something else, a payoff on a much grander level still, called self and soul. So we watch the sunrise here. It's so amazing that, like the poet Blake, we may want to, uh, we maybe want to insist on its supernatural origin. When the sun rises, he writes sardonically, don't you see a drowned disk of fire somewhat like a penny? Oh, no, no, I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But another English mystic, Thomas Trahan, went straight to the paradoxical truth of it. By the very right of your senses, he wrote, you enjoy the world. Doth not the glory of the sun pay tribute to your sight? While we watch the sunrise, the sun, as I said before, is singing our song. Oscar Wilde summed up the shocking but wonderful reality of it. It is in the brain that everything takes place. It's in the brain that the poppy is red, that the apple is odorous, that the skylark sings. Francis Crook, I'm sure some of you know his book, 100 Years Later, in his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, he put forward the same idea. Um, but it's not really so astonishing. That's part of the point I want to make. At some level, we can't but already know that we're responsible. Since we were children, we've all explored the wonders of subjectivity. Children are natural-born philosophers. Back in the playground, we were already asking the deep questions, for example, about how, about our, for example, about our own peculiar role in generating the world of phenomenal colours. Could the light of the sun that I experience as subjective red is something that you experience as subjective blue, for example. How could we even ask the questions unless we'd already hit on that strange truth that all this glory, in the end, is down to us? So I think we should indeed take a high view of ourselves for being conscious. What am I doing here? What's it like to be me? What's it like to be the author behind the scenes of such magical stuff? Well. One important thing is, it's like, it's like owning it. It's like it's all being, belonging to us. Thomas Traherne was actually much more radical in his fantasies than the prim Victorians who helped set up that other stained glass window uh, would have thought. There's a new window in Hereford Cathedral. Because he, here he writes, the streets were mine, the temple was mine, the people were mine, their clothes and gold and silver were mine, the skies were mine, and so were the sun and the moon and the stars, and all the world was mine, and I, the only spectator and enjoyer of it. Well, Trahan, rather like Huxley under his masculine, is in a peculiar state of self-congratulation now. Mostly we're much more laid back. We're used to it. We take it for granted. But what we're taking for granted, in the end, is a kind of miracle. And for humans, it shapes our sense of self, of who we are. In many ways, uh, but I want to concentrate on one especially. What's the most psychologically salient property of conscious sensations? Well, I think it's just this, Trahan's obsession, that it does belong to me and to me alone, that I am indeed the sole spectator of it. 
Now, the idea that what we're doing is entirely logically a private may indeed be an illusion, a consequence of the way it gets set up, without having just this one privileged viewpoint, which makes it de facto, and that no one else can see it as we see it. But psychologically, this privacy is hugely impressive, creating the irresistible sense of myself as a separate bubble of consciousness. And how does this affect people psychologically? I'd say it encourages, encourages us to believe, as we never would do otherwise, in our own metaphysical importance, that each individual human being is indeed a focal singularity within the universe. You'll hear it said that there's no such thing as the self, that individualism is a recent invention, that no man is an island in tower of himself. But to the contrary, at the deepest level of personal experience, people discover the opposite. That when it comes to consciousness, every man is an island in tower of himself. <coughs> I said that consciousness as theatre affects our outlook on life. Here's a big enough effect, a big enough effect on human psychology. Yet, Ask, ask it again, could this really be one of the reasons consciousness was favoured by natural selection? Could there have been any advantage, biologically speaking, in thinking of ourselves as so extraordinarily special? Well, I admit mine is an unfashionable view, but yes, whatever the bad press from the philosophers and the ethicists, I have no hesitation in saying that individualism, selfism, represents a real step up in the life game. William James, 130 years ago, said it for me. Uh, he wasn't shy of being politically correct. The altogether unique kind of interest with each, which each human mind feels in those parts of creation which it can call me or mine may be a moral riddle, but it is a fundamental psychological fact. No mind can take the same interest in his neighbours <laughs> as it is. Um, no, no mind can take the same interest in his neighbour's me as in his own. Try to think how much step on it. Um, and the self-interest and self-importance that follows from this is, I think, immensely empowering. Once we each put our own phenomenal self at the centre of our psychic life, once we anchor our plans and ambitions to the existence of this amazing thing, me, we become a very different kind of being. Oscar Wilde put it in his own narcissistic way. The aim of life is self-development, to realise one's nature perfectly. That's what each of us is here for. To love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. But as a matter of fact, he wasn't so far wrong. As conscious creatures, we human beings have become naturally the kind of beings that, does, that aspire not only to be ourselves through continually affirming our presence in the world, but to make more of ourselves through learning, creativity, symbolic expression, spiritual growth, social influence, love of others, and so on. Now, you may be surprised I said at this point, love of others. Uh, I said consciousness separates us and isolates us, and so it does. It promotes individualism, and so it does. But that's not the end of the story. What happens next makes up for all the narcissism. Because the fact is that from soon after our first discovery as infants of the glories of being me, we humans are led to a daring speculation about the selves of other people. If I myself have this astonishing phenomenon at the centre of my existence, then isn't it likely, indeed certain, that the same holds for other people? Then what's that say about the kind of creatures which we humans collectively are. It's not just me. Every one of us is a creative hub of consciousness. All men have been endowed by the Creator with an, with an inalienable, an inviolable mind space of their own. Just as special, just as private, just as precious and important to them as mine is to me. Let me let's try and speak for us again. He delightedly expressed this. You never enjoy the world right till you perceive yourself to be the sole heir of the whole world, and more than so, because men are in it who are, every one, sole heirs as well as you. It's wonderful paradox at the end of that. We are indeed, and 
want to say, a society of souls. The idea is extraordinarily potent, psychologically, ethically, politically. And I dare say, from the moment it took off amongst our ancestors, it must have been highly adaptive. In fact, I'd go so far as to suggest that this change in spiritual worldview marked a watershed in the evolution of our species. The point at which human beings first began to treat each other, other, other humans, as persons of equal status to themselves. Independent, private, respectable, responsible, free-willed loco of phenomenal consciousness. Everyone else, a soul in good standing, the equal of ourselves. A soul, I said. Or should I really be using that word? Doesn't the word soul carry too much baggage? Well, it does carry too much baggage, and I think that's just why I should be using it. Keith Ward, the theologian, wrote, the whole point of talking of the soul is to remind ourselves constantly that we transcend all the conditions of our material existence. We transcend them precisely in being indefinable, always more than can be seen or described, subjects of experience and action, unique and irreplaceable. So here's where I'm driving. For members of the human species, to live in a world where people in general have this opinion of themselves is to live in what we can call the soul niche. I mean niche now. In the conventional ecological use of the term, the environment to which a species has become adapted and where it is designed to flourish. Trout live in rivers. Gorillas live in forests. Bed bugs live in beds. Human beings live in soul land. Soul land is the territory of the spirit. It's a place where the magical interiority of human minds makes itself felt on every side. A place where we naturally assume that every other human being lives as we do in the extended present of phenomenal consciousness. Where we recognize and celebrate the awesome possibilities of individual, private joy and suffering. It's a place where the fate of one's own and other people's souls is a constant talking point, where souls are the subject of gossip, of tender concern, of mean speculation, of manipulation by prayer and spells. It's a place where the claims of the spirit begin to rank as highly as the claims of the flesh, where we join hands with others in celebrating the, uh, the beauties of the world we have enchanted. I could go on in that vein, but I don't have to. You live there. You know. And the consequence of all this was, well, the consequence is that human beings are set up by nature to dwell on the eternal questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Consciousness sets up the questions, but it also begins to answer them. Answer them. And it's been in asking and answering these questions that our species, as a biological entity, has raised itself to the level nearly of the gods. We take another five minutes. Well, can we begin to guess when this development might have happened historically in, the, in human history? I like to think that the archaeological record can, in fact, provide some clues. In the villa, vi, vi, village of Villa Farmish in the Valencia region of Spain, there are some rock paintings in a cave just below the castle, which date from about 15,000 years ago. Um, when I visited the cave a few years ago, uh, I was taken aback to see the resemblance of one of the drawings on the rock, um, to a drawing I'd made many years earlier to illustrate the privatization of sensation. And I can't but wonder, was this uh, painting on the rock in fact an early Neolithic representation and celebration of what it means to have a self? And if that's so, let me take the speculation a little bit further. What about all those other spirals and cups and rings within rings, designs that seem to speak so strongly of interiority that are a recurring theme in rock art wherever human beings have settled right across the world, in Asia, in Australia, in America, even in Cambridge, England. Um, this one was found last year. Uh, archaeologists have had no good theories of what these symbols are about. It's been suggested that a multiple representation, such as this one from uh, Kerry uh, County in Ireland, it's been suggested that these are some kind of field plans. Um, well, with due reservation, I, I think these are souls. These are soul plans. This, in fact, is the Bronze Age version of this. What the rock artist was saying is 
here I live. So, well, I am running out of some time, but particularly since this is an anthropological audience, I can't leave it there. I'm just going to finish on a different note. Here live souls. But of course, surely we must now say, here lived souls. What's certain is that the human beings who made those marks are here no longer. The marks on the rock persist. The individual people do not. Soul land, I have to say it, is dangerous territory. And you know the reasons. I'm not, uh, I'm not finished yet. Maybe you didn't even see the, 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 the eagle in the sky. Um, I'm almost finished. But I, I showed you uh, at the very beginning my son in the waves off the coast of Southern Ireland. You can see the Skelly Islands in the distance. On the hillside above this beach are the graves of local people who must have played in those same waves a few hundred years before. One of those graves was open and I looked inside. The problem is, the higher you climb, the harder you fall. As the future of the individual self has acquired ever greater psychological significance in the course of human evolution, so the death of this self must surely have come to be an ever greater tragedy. A tragedy for the one person who loved himself and, the tra and a tragedy for the others who loved him too. This particular person has gone. The very person whose consciousness and intellect were designed by nature to make him believe himself a being of such singular importance. We can hardly underestimate the loss involved. Yevgeny Yevtushenko said it beautifully for, beautifully for us. No people are uninteresting. Their fate is like the chronicle of planets. Nothing in them is not particular. The planet is dissimilar from planet. In any man who dies, there dies with him his first snow and kiss and fight. Not people die, but worlds die in them. George Steiner, the critic, has called death a scandal. Individual souls surely deserve better than to be snuffed out in less than a hundred years after their arrival here on their earth. Now, I suppose that it's true that people like us in this room, or at least some of us, who think like detached evolutionary scientists, may be able to reconcile ourselves to death, at least in principle, because we recognize that this has indeed always been nature's way. Individual survival has never been the main concern of biological evolution. What has mattered is the survival of genes and germlines. In fact, evolutionary progress would come to a stop if individuals actually went on forever. And perhaps we don't have to be scientists to think, at least in some ways, on these lines. For non-scientists too, of course, can surely take comfort from the idea of cultural con continuity. The thought that if our individual selves can't survive, they or we can still have some sort of presence after death through the things we leave behind, especially, especially through the lasting effects we've had on other people's lives. Well, maybe we can take some comfort from it, uh, but I'm not so sure. Woody Allen, for one, was having none of it. He said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in <laughs> And in wanting to live on in, on in his apartment, Alan surely speaks the deepest language of the embodied human soul. There are no two ways about it. As conscious creatures, we've been selected, designed, to consider death the ultimate betrayal. <coughs> so what's the way out of this one? Could consciousness itself provide a way out? Well, perhaps the fact that the human species is still here and that our ancestors didn't find the prospect of death totally soul-destroying, if I can put it that way, perhaps that's living proof that human beings did find a way out. And indeed, as I described some length in the book, in fact, the last third of it, um, I have no time to tell you now, Consciousness did have one more trick up its sleeve. Nature gave each of us a natural soul, a common or garden, spiritual presence in this world. But in so doing, she paved the way for human culture to come up with the idea of a supernatural soul, an out-of-this-world soul, a soul that goes on living, in some sense, 
even after the body has turned to, death, turned to dust. I'm sure that despite all, the individuals buried in the tombs off the beach went to their deaths in the full expectation of being resurrected somewhere else after they died. Well, perhaps this isn't quite the solution Woody Allen was asking for. Nonetheless, you can't live on in Manhattan. You could do it worse than to live on as an angel. Okay, so uh, then I have a lot of time. And I'll end that. How will we recognize the presence of this inner life in another animal? And uh, since I'm using the evidence from human beings of our simply going the extra mile to engage with life, to take pleasure in being there, and to create sensory phenomena for their own sake, I would say that it's highly suggestive. In fact, I've no doubt that dolphins do have a phenomenal consciousness of something rather like ours. I don't think dolphins live in soul now. I don't think they take it that step further and begin to uh, take the, 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 the cultural steps which, which we have, we've taken on the back of this more primitive basic phenomenal experience. But yes, dolphins, yes. Dogs, yes. Crabs, probably not. Worms, I don't think so. We have a Andy here at the front question. I'm, I'm struck by something about your presentation, Nick. You're talking about a sensory modality about things like redding and blueing, if we can put them that way. All your examples have been, or the really powerful ones, have been linguistic and intellectual. Aren't you sort of, as it were, um, selling us an illusion? Well, I, hope, I mean, I, uh, the later examples were, were uh, intellectual of a sort, I, um, I suppose. Um, but uh, they were people's response to try and trying to express the ineffable, to, put, to, to, to bring on, on to bring other people on board to what um, they're experiencing. And so, yes, I mean, if we're doing the natural history of consciousness, we have to attend to the effects consciousness has on what humans say and do and think and how they express themselves. Equally, of course, with animals. So, of course, we, we, there's very much less to go on with animals. That's all we've got to go on. Consciousness, if it's evolved, has evolved because of the thing, ways it changed our minds. And some of the most obvious ways in which it changes our minds is in leading us to make the kind of um, statements we do about what it's like to be here and our love of life. Um, I thought most of my examples were actually about sensation. I mean, I was... Uh, Maybe Huxley, just, you know, t talking about aquamarine and topaz and so on, but he's describing the colours uh, on the books in front of him. Someone here had a yes, please. I just want to ask if uh, you felt there were any implications of your argument on the, uh, the debate regarding free will. If free will is rooted in consciousness and consciousness is rooted in evolution, then really free will becomes something deterministic. Uh, I think it's my, my, these arguments have no bearing on free will at all. Consciousness, um, of course, is used in many different uh, ways by psychologists and philosophers, and it deserves to be. I mean, we don't have enough words to go around. Um, but uh, when we're talking about uh, 
our, 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 our knowledge of the origins of our actions. That's much more cognitive uh, uh, issue. Um, I say I have free will because I don't find my will, my, my actions to be caused by anything else. But that's, in a sense, an intellectual. You know, we are intellectually, to go back to Andy's question, we are intellectually free agents. And it's very interesting why we should believe ourselves to be so and what the payoff of that is. I think it does. I mean, people have argued that it, there is, in fact, good, it, 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 some advantage in thinking of ourselves as being such. And it certainly, given I've sense, said that phenomenal consciousness boosts our sense of self and gives us this ball we want to hold up in the air. See, that's the beginning of selfhood. But once we begin to examine the properties of the self, we begin to discover that at another level it seems to have extraordinary uh, uh, qualities like uh, being an agent of the world uh, and possibly having free will. But my arguments in themselves don't, 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 don't bear it. I don't think free, uh, most philosophers now on think that free will is a problem. Um, it's an interesting psychological issue and uh, it's interesting on the conditions under which we sometimes lose it. Um, in fact, for example, find that we feel that our bodies are taken over by some other force. But um, I think you know, we, could, we already have a fairly good model of how ideas of will and agency arise. Hello. I can um, totally agree with the main point of your lecture that we should celebrate consciousness in all its uh, forms and so on. Um, the point I... Isn't that possible? Is it possible to make that consistent with, at the same time, believing that consciousness is not a separate substance that cuts into the neurology and pushes the atoms around in a way they wouldn't otherwise go? In other words, isn't it possible to believe that it's simply an effect, entirely an effect, of the action of the brain, and it's the brain and its evolution, uh, physical evolution, which gave rise to consciousness? Well, yeah, yes, I, I mean, but I, I, I'm a materialist, I'm a scientist, I think that all natural phenomena have material causes. Consciousness is a natural phenomenon. Um, it's one of the first things which we, you know, when we, we enter in this world, the first thing we found out about what the world contains is consciousness, but it's generated by matter. Um, and what I try and do much more length in the book is to show how a material brain could create something which gives the illusion of being immaterial, of being out of this world. Um, and uh, so I think that, and that's the way in which you know, science should try to go before it gives up, as some people have recommended, like said philosopher David Chalmers, by simply positing another kind of substance, rather as uh, decocted you know, many years ago, a spiritual substance living in parallel with, uh, existing in parallel with the physical world. Um, I don't think we need to go that way. Um, we need one for the middle section, which we have had, please. Well, very much following along the lines of what we were just saying, I wanted to ask you, uh, you, you said very early in your talk that scientists should be very careful when they're looking for uh, consciousness. Do you think there is uh, any hope of uh, scientific experimentation supporting the ideas? Well, uh, it, it better be, um, <laughs> unless I'm wrong. I mean, <laughs> um, if, you know, it's, I'm putting forward a, a serious hypothesis about something that's going on inside the brain and its history. Um, I, I don't think we're anywhere near identifying uh, these nerve, nerve circuits yet. And, um, uh, but, and I, and I, but I, I do want to emphasize what I said already, that if an if we can sort of even begin to isolate, although not, not much is isolated in the brain, but we can detect what networks are, are active. And if we can see what kind of activity they're generating, then we'll have to think about it in a very special way if we're going to catch on to why this is the activity in, in the brain which to the subject adds up to consciousness. Because it's not going to look like that to the outsider. Um, and uh, I... I mean, I've got some other remarks to make about it. I think, think for example, you know, people like Christoph Koch, distinguished neuroscientist, who is looking for the neural correlate of consciousness. He's looking for it in the sensory cortex. Um, I think he should be looking for it in the motor cortex. Um, because it's a bodily expression which we're then representing as being conscious. It's going to involve the frontal lobes. Um, Many people want to ask questions. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop them. But can I just say that we're actually having a reception 
after this uh, talk by you now. Um, so for those of you who didn't be bothered to make the trek, it's up the Old Witch to Halton Street, to the old building on Halton Street, many of you know, on the sixth floor in the anthropology department. Uh, there is a small library right on the landing when you get to the sixth floor of the old building. And we're going to be having a, a drink there if you can join us. So if you have questions, you can come there. And also I believe there are people who perhaps bought copies of uh, Nick's book outside and like for him to sign the copies. If you could come to the anthropology department to do that, that would be better than us trying to do it here. That way we can move on over to the old book. Yeah? Six for the old book. So please join me in thanking Nick again for the time.